Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. We're putting out more podcasts and we're recording them at home at the moment as well, partly because of coronavirus, but also because of the anti-racism movement and the protests that have emerged all around the world since the death of George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd. I should say. And my guest today is Emma Dabry, who is an Irish Nigerian academic, author, television journalist and broadcaster. Her debut book, Don't Touch My Hair, came out last year, but has just come out again in paperback. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Welcome. Hi. Happy to be here. I mean, let's start with Don't Touch My Hair. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it? What is it? Yeah, so the UK edition of my book is called Don't Touch My Hair. The US edition is actually published today under a different title, which is Twisted, the the Tangled History of Black Hair Culture. But really what the book is, is a um, ostensibly it's about hair and the history and politics of black hair, the way, the, the, the significance that, hair had to African cultures before there was any stigma attached to it because it was something that was um, a fundamental um, medium for cultural and creative expression. But also post-slavery and colonialism, the way in which black hair came to be um, came to be a, a, a medium through which you could see the policing and kind of regulatory and disciplinary effects of kind of white supremacist culture on black bodies, but also the way black people resisted and contested some of those forces can all be expressed through hair culture. So there's often this idea that, um, you know, hair is, when you're talking about hair, that it's something very superficial and and shallow and not really worthy of any any kind of greater attention. With the book, I really wanted to put that idea to to rest and to show that hair is significant in all cultures, but it is particularly significant in in African cultures, Um, especially because even though Africa has a strong literary tradition and um, tradition of the written word, which is often something that is, is not known, a lot of the cultures that I focused on were primarily oral cultures. And in these oral cultures, one of the ways that knowledge was disseminated were through different visual languages, hair, hair, hair being one of those. I mean, um, I try not to assume any knowledge on this podcast because some people know everything about what we're talking about and some people know nothing. So can we just sort of, and, and language is really important, I think. So um, just, can we just start by talking about what what is black hair? What's African hair? I'm looking at you now and <laughs> your hair looks great. Thank you. Sort of, how do you describe, you know, what your hair is now and the different ways that you wear it? Yeah, okay. So I um my background is Irish and Nigerian, so I have an Irish mom, well, an Irish Caribbean mom, but she's white, and I have a black Nigerian father. There's a variety of hair textures that are considered that fall into the category of black hair, but often people, often, not always, because I would be an exception, people with mixed heritage have a hair start, have a hair texture that is often um, a looser curl that kind of grows down rather than, than up and out. And my hair has definitely favored the Nigerian part of my heritage more more strongly. At the moment, I have a twist out, um, but it's it's quite a um, that's what the hairstyle, or that's what this method of doing your hair is called. But it's um, not looking actually as I had as I had intended it to. But the, one of the I guess beauties of um, black hair is that it's 
diff when you wear it out, it's difficult to predict what way it's going to behave. So it can look very different from one day to the next. I had been planning on wearing different um, headphones, which actually acted as a nice kind of hairband for my hair. But then a technical, there was a technical hitch. But one of the things about black hair is its, is its versatility. This texture of hair, you can make it bone straight. I could wear it out in a big afro. I could do countless kind of braided corn row, cane row, patterns I could attach so many different types of extensions it, you can just look you can do you can kind of achieve anything with it so when we talk about when we talk about black hair being natural what, what does that mean so natural black hair to me is hair that is not chemically treated so I used to like millions of black women and even many black men particularly up until the 1960s, used to straighten, chemically relax um, their hair. And I did that through up until to the end of my 20s. Um, the word relax is um, an interesting choice of word because it's a very innocuous, kind of gentle sounding word for a process that is, in fact, very brutal and um really damaging it actually deforms the 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 curl pattern but also it's linked to all sorts of horrible um kind of health concerns from fri fri uh, fibroids to types of cancer to like it, it disrupts it can disrupt the the kind of endocrine system so it has a lot of toxicity um, associated with it. So I relaxed my hair personally because I was ashamed of my hair texture and I wanted to, yeah, it was like a bid for assimilation, you know, it was something, it was something that I was doing to achieve what I had been taught was normal hair because my hair wasn't wasn't normal. Some people will say natural hair is only if you have it out in an afro. I would contest that and say it's any it's any style that isn't chemically treated. So even when my hair is braided, to me that is natural hair. So, so where did your own first thoughts about your hair sort of arise? I mean, I'm guessing you grew up in a place where there weren't many people who looked like you. Yes. Well, I spent the first few years of my life in Atlanta, Georgia where I was far more ordinary and I was um, living with my mom, but also kind of my extended Nigerian family. So in that context, my hair was ordinary, but there's still stigma in black communities about hair texture. And as I was saying earlier, I'm mixed. And so when you're mixed, there's that expectation that you will have quote unquote good hair. But with that being said, I was still... I, I still looked more normal in that in that context. As soon as I moved, and I didn't think about race. Um, and you might say, well, what kind of four-year-old child is thinking about race? But as soon as I moved to Ireland, I was thinking about it a, a lot because it was made clear to me. That's where I learned that I was black and where I learned that that wasn't a good thing. And I would say that my hair was the was one of the biggest features that I felt self-conscious about and that I felt kind of very much identified me as other and that seemed a spectacle and that people seemed obsessed with. People would literally cross the street to come and touch my hair because, and then they would talk about me kind of over my hair adults as though I wasn't, as though there wasn't like a human being attached, a sentient being attached to the hair. So I just, was it well-meaning or was it? <laughs> was it well-meaning? I don't think the intention was was well was well-meaning. I think it was it was it was curiosity. It was like a sense of me, I am I was the first black person that many people I met had ever seen in real life. Um, I was I've been told that countless times the first black person people had met that would be unlikely in the Ireland of today it's a lot more I, I, I am hesitant to use the word diverse because I have so many issues with it um there is a there is a, a visible um non-white presence 
there's a visible non-white population. You, I mean, you mentioned you've got a problem with, with the word diverse. What, what, what's your problem with it? Oh, gosh. I, I, I feel it's just part of a, a nexus of terminology that, you know, this idea that diversity and inclusivity and representation uh, are going to solve the, the deep and centuries-long racial divisions that have been intentionally engineered in our society um, can somehow be overcome by what have almost become buzzwords and are often kind of lacking, I feel, in the generative power that is required to really do the work in terms of resolving kind of racial racial injustice that needs to be done. And also I feel diverse is sometimes used by people who are scared to say the word black. Um, they'll describe an area as diverse. And I'm like, it's not actually... Or a person as a diverse person. As... I go, I'm not a diverse person. <laughs> exactly. I'm just me. You know, just... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, so it's kind of like, a, a, like a, a liberal kind of cop out from like saying this word that there's like discomfort around. Um, uh, I think that's really interesting though, because diversity is used, I think, most commonly in the workplace. Yeah. You know, and, and very much so at the moment where people are talking about trying to address headcount and, you know, um, the number of uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic or ethnic minority, depending on which side of that argument you are. Um, people there are in an office yeah um and what you're saying is that you know sorting out the numbers doesn't sort out the problem i don't think sorting out the numbers alone uh, i don't think populating um certain institutions with just a few more black and brown faces is going to is going to change the problem these are often far more underlying systemic issues and I think there's a lot of things that need to be dismantled and rebuilt rather than reformed and not even reformed but remaining the same the systems remaining the same but just putting in a few more diverse faces we're about to three weeks into this round of anti-racist Black Lives Matter protests mm -hmm. since the killing of George Floyd. Um, how, how have you felt watching it? I mean, do, do you feel that we are really are in a moment of change? It's, it's, it's hard to predict. I will say that in my life, I've never seen such a global... It's not necessarily... It's not intentionally coordinated, but there is a synchronicity between what's happening in lots of different parts of the world simultaneously. I've never seen such a volume of white people be expressing their desire to do kind of anti-racist work. Another thing I've seen is, um, I was talking about being from Ireland and um, growing up and there not being many black people or any people of color there. Um, in the years that I've left, there, um, I think there started to be there started to be more migration there by non non white people, or more migration there in general um, in the late nineties. And so now there's a generation of black and brown and non white Irish people who have now like come of age. And around these pro in the wake of what was happening in the states, I saw Black Lives Matter protests in not just in Dublin, across Ireland, but um, this huge expression of black Irishness, which I had never seen kind of so cohesively expressed before. So it's also like, the, and I would imagine that is happening in lots of other countries as well. So it's also like this kind of, uh, some of these newer nascent emerging identities, you know, like really expressing themselves in this moment and kind of identifying an, an, an agenda. At the same time, um, I do worry a little bit um, or I have concerns that um, I, I, I've been trying to put out um, resources about um, the, inve the invention of race and the way in which race was constructed 
the way the white race and the black race were invented in the 1600s, where it's codified into law and the slave laws in Barbados. And one of the reasons that this idea of whiteness is invented and blackness is to dehumanize black people in order to justify the enslavement that um, European economies are becoming, it will become increasingly dependent on and the, the, the huge uh, and obscene wealth that is created from the exploitation of black people. How, how, do you, how, do you think, how do you think going back to that history helps us work out our present? I mean, it's a, there's a natural development, obviously, from being defined and oppressed and dehumanised to saying we will be proud of who we are, we will celebrate our culture, we will express ourselves how we want to. Mm -hmm. um, but that, in a way, underpins the division, doesn't it, and the separateness. So, so wh where, does it, where does it take you, do you think? I think if you want to start, um, if you want to start dismantling lots of the structures of our society that are oppressive, we need to understand that they were constructed. They're not things that are just naturally occurring in the world. These are socially engineered institutions that exist um, for a whole host of reasons, but generally it can boil down to um, to, 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 to better ex exploit people, you know. But where, what, what's the desirable end point? I mean, where do you want to Ooh. end up? I mean, if, if race was engineered mm -hmm. as an idea, mm -hmm. um, you know, is it desirable to de-engineer it? You know, is, is, the, is the ultimate end point a place where we decide this is a construct, it doesn't mean anything, we're going to do away with it? Well, or, it, or is it something different? I think, yeah, we have to be we have to be careful that the the conversation isn't kind of hijacked by bad faith actors who would be like, oh yeah, actually, it it does it doesn't exist. So um, there, how how can there how can there be racism? You know, because there's always people who are looking for that opportunity to deny that racism is real. In terms of an end point, like one of my favorite philosophers is um, someone called Fred, Fred Moten. He's a, a black American, an African American um, scholar um, who writes about blackness, but rather than writing about blackness as a biological um, essentialist entity, he Describe, he talks about blackness and fugitivity and blackness as a radical space where we can reject oppressive norms. So it's more like blackness as they are um, moving away from this idea of blackness as a biological racial reality into blackness as a space for kind of radical thought and action. When we think about what we want from within the confines of where we are now will be very different to how we would think about what we would want if we had kind of more liberatory and expansive thinking, if that makes sense. So to go back to like diversity and inclusion and representation, I feel those type of things are really us projecting a future that is or trying to create a future that is totally constrained by the limits of now. It's just not the kind of like expansive thinking that is required to produce very radically different futures. What do you think the relationship is between the way race has been defined and our economic structures, capitalism? I mean, it's, is, is, is race essentially a product of capitalism? Absolutely. And I see that analysis um, kind of missing in a lot of the, I, I don't see that relationship being referred to enough. So when we're thinking about this invention of, 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 of race and, and why it happened, it is, this is also um, at the birth of the form of capitalism that we live that we live under now so i would say race and capitalism are our siblings and the um the, the the system that brought such wealth to 
Western and European countries that was um, so dependent on the transatlantic slave trade is where we see the growth and development of the economic system that we still live under to this day. And this is also the period that is the, the beginnings of modernity. So the, um, that, that, whole, that whole project was funded by this enslaved African labor that required race to be invented to justify it. So the, the, the whole idea of modernity and the culture and society that we live under to this day has its birthplace in that really psychotic history. Can I ask you about your own whiteness and, yeah. and where that comes into your identity? Yeah. I mean, you know, are you, are you, are you black? Are you mixed? You know, are you white in any way if you're fundamentally black? I, I identify like very strongly as Irish. I'm very reluctant. I, I would identify myself as like black and mi mixed, mixed black, you know. I have an Irish mum, which I speak about like all the time. The way race operates is um, you don't, you're either white or you're, or you're not white, you know. Um, if you are like visibly of African descent, you don't, you don't get to be white. So the way whiteness is constructed is, and we're, we, we've acknowledged it's, it's, it's an invention, the way whiteness is constructed is around these ideas of purity, you know, and if there is anything that contaminates, that dilutes that purity and it's visible, you're not white. And actually, in many cases, even when it wasn't visible, um, there were systems and laws in places and parts of the world to still deny people access to whiteness if that other racial identity was um, was was known even if they even if they appeared white of course they could pass as white but that's a whole that's a whole other kind of conversation whereas blackness was never constructed around these rigorously policed um boundaries of purity there are points when we see more of this reification of of of, of race and you see the boundaries of blackness being also kind of becoming maybe less porous, you know, more, um, more rigid. And you see more ideas emerging about pure blackness in the way you see about pure whiteness, you know. And it's interesting to observe how at different political moments um those 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 boundaries become uh kind of more sometimes more reinforced and other times kind of more more open um, it's very yeah. interesting at the moment isn't it i think because um in response to what's happened to george floyd i think you've had people you know of I mean, I personally hate the the BAME acronym. Um, <laughs> Me if too. You think about <laughs> black Asian people, other ethnic minorities. In a way, people have all come together mm -hmm. uh, to campaign together and and to to say things have got to change. But but as you say, there's also been a, an extent to which all of these communities have, have also recognised their differences, um, and that Black Lives Matter might be about black people mm -hmm. and that that's a different experience of racism to Indian people or Chinese people or any other particular minority. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, personally, I wonder whether this is a good thing or whether it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. Because when I was sort of growing up, we were very much in that sort of, you're either white or you're black. Mm -hmm. And um, if we all stick together as black, then... There's more of us and we're allowed a voice. That that seems to have gone now. While I, I, I have um, reservations with um, 
with the way things play out differently for people of African descent who are known as black, I have concerns about other people also describing themselves as black. So I have concerns about that, the particular use of the word in that way. But with that being said, I strongly believe, my thinking is increasingly going towards like coalition and comradeship. And what I'm seeing is not necessarily that. I'm seeing um, a reification of people falling back into very rigidly policed identity lines, which I, I, I understand why that's happening. But if we think about the history of race and what it's invented to do, this that's not that that those forms of nationalism, um, racial nationalism, um, are are not actually um, subversive. You know, they're actually furthering the work that race was invented to do. So, my thinking and writing and work is going increasingly towards coalition, where we recognise the differences that that we have, but also. Um, we we identify the common interests and the and the mutuality and what the, the yeah the, the mutual interests that exist and i think sometimes with very rigidly policed identity lines what happens is fictive fictive kinships are imagined between people who are of the same race but you know they really want very different things and then other points of affinity that would exist between people who are of what who, people who are racialized as different races but actually have these um these these affinities those are foreclosed you know those those are sh the, the potential for those is, is shut down by the the, the rigidly policed identity so I, I wonder if it's also because of the way we gather data and the way we present it in in sociology and, and, and other things as well now and that increasingly we break down uh, racial groups mm -hmm. um, in terms of their outcomes and their um, educational attainment and, and all the rest of it and, and that encourages us to see each other as, as, as having less in common than perhaps we do. Yeah you know it's a, it's a re it's a difficult one because I, like sometimes I would read my, my PhD research looks explicitly at the, the mixed race um, cat, racial category. Um, and a lot of conversations about mixed race wouldn't identify who they were talking, who they're talking about, which is really confusing because the outcomes for somebody that is Chinese and white are very different between somebody that is African Caribbean and white. And even yeah. the outcomes for somebody that's African Caribbean and white are different to those that are, uh, those for somebody who's black African and white, you know? So I guess in order to get that information, there does need to be that specificity, but then that specificity also further reinforces these idea the these these ideas of um of, of of racial division so it it's just i feel like we don't have the the language or the concepts to really address these issues where 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 we are now you know i feel like are you still told that you're not black or not black enough it depends where i am and i think the way i identify would be different based on where I had grown up and been socialized but because when I was growing up in Ireland there was very little knowledge or awareness of a of any of, of being of being of being mixed you know people would see my mom and they'd be like oh you're you're adopted and I'd be like no <laughs> what they'd be like she's white like how does how does how does that work kind of thing I was like isn't it apparent from looking at me but I was very like lonely as as a child in many ways because of the racism I experienced so I really sought my refuge in in, in books and I read a lot of particularly like black American literature and history 
And I saw my experience, and actually some of the children were mixed, but that's where I saw myself reflected. And I saw experiences and histories that kind of like made, made sense of my own. So I had a strong kind of, I had a strong identification as black and with blackness. I then went back to Atlanta um, again, where this is in the 90s. I spent my summers there with the my dad's side of the family who were Nigerian and black American. And again, there in that very black environment, there wasn't a an idea of being mi mixed race. In fact, if I had said that, it would have been kind of odd. I was seen as black, but a light skinned black person specific kind of, yeah a light-skinned black person and then it was when I moved to the UK that I first I remember describing myself as black and a friend of mine was just like oh but you're mixed race and I was just like yeah I know but like they're kind of you know I've been racialized as black culturally that's what I identify as um this is how I identify it. but it was that's when I first it, it was I think in the UK there's a stronger um category and identification of mixed race specifically than there is in than there was in Ireland or than I experienced in America so I think it's kind of geographically specific as well but how I identify I guess now would be you know mixed black black mixed <laughs> Irish black and Nigerian Irish and Nigerian you know it's kind of for me there's a there's a, 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 a there should be for everyone there should be a fluidity again it sort of brings you to what is the desirable end state you know a lot of people you know I, I always think of sort of well-meaning elderly ladies when I think about this when I was a kid <laughs> sort of sort of going you know but well I'm colorblind you know I don't see race mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and you kind of think, well, you know, is is the ultimate desire, you know, end state, desirable end state, effectively some sort of color blindness where people don't notice, or is it a multicultural, all embracing, we're all we're all a little bit different, but we're all fundamentally the same, you know, what is the sort of, how are you bringing up your kids to think about different identities? And, yeah. So I feel like a lot of like I think with my kids, they just kind of learn by osmosis because these conversations are like happening in the house, you know, so I don't know that so, so, uh, sometimes we'll have to break stuff down. Well, one is only eight months old, but again, by, by osmosis but with my older son, I will have to break stuff down for him because um, often probably what we're talking about is going over his head um, because because we're still in a place where race, the construction, has a huge impact on 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 people's lives and and, and opportunities. Um, it's only really white people who who have the who are able to whiteness is operates in such a way that it's kind of like invisible. You know, it's it's not really it's not like a race. It's just like the default for being a normal person. So only people that operate from that position can say, I don't see race. So to be in that um, position when other people kind of live and die by how they're, how they're racialized is, 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 is really problematic. So when I was a child, my race like completely defined everybody's like, one of the reasons I, I I left Ireland, probably the primary reason, was because I didn't want to be like the black girl. Like that is just that's kind of like the, the the sum of my of my being. I just wanted to be like a person that was like known for whatever makes me up. Um, so for people that just get to be you know individuals, just get to be wh white people, to then say they don't see race, I think that's kind of like a function of their whiteness. So while while race is still something that is so um, potent and so many people don't have the luxury of saying they don't see it, um, I think that that's just, that's, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know? You can't jump to saying you don't see it when it's so defining for people. So I like to end, I like to end this interview by always asking people, 
how they would change the world if they could just wave a magic wand. So how would you change it? Untold damage has been done under in 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 the name of of race and through this racial lens with which we view our, ourselves and the world um and also use it uses use as a, a justification for um exploitation and the system of capitalism that we live under so if i could change one thing it would be to to live under a system of capitalism that didn't require race and i think to live in a world that recognized diversity in systems of living so not having this i the way the way we the way the world's organized now is everybody has to every country every part of the world has to you know be brought into the market and conform to a capitalist infrastructure it would be i guess the way the world was before colonialism where there were lots of different types of people living in lots of different types of ways that suited the environment that, in, that suited the particular and specific environment and culture that they that, that that they were in, rather than a system that has originated from this part of the world, um, that has been imposed all across the globe, really to the to the detriment of 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 human life. Emma Dabry, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world and telling, telling us all about your own life and where it fits into this story. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. If you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. Our producers are Rachel Evans and Hila May. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel as well. Until next time, bye-bye.